Hello and welcome to Dishing It Live here at Resin X in Aberdeen. This is the first Dishing It Live and I'm very excited to get stuck into all the food chat with our three local businesses joining the panel tonight. Joining me tonight we have Alex and Ruth of Sugarbird Wines, we have Eve Smith of Fat Batch Bakery and we also have Kevin DeGleish of Amuse all chatting about their story so far and what Aberdeen's food future might look like. So without further ado, let's get stuck into tonight's panel. <laughs> So let's, so Dishing It is all about the story so far. So let's rewind the clock back to where your stories all started. So starting with you, Kevin, you've been a chef for many years, working in establishments across the UK. Um, when did you realise you were good at cooking and you wanted to pursue that as a career? I wouldn't say I was any good at cooking but then, but I think I think I got a job as a, as a dishwasher um, and I just loved the the camaraderie in the kitchen and the guy that was the head chef was really good and it was a great buzz and I thought this could be quite interesting so it all started me back in Hoyk when I was 15 years old. Um, I was actually pretty good at rugby to be honest so Jim Telfer was the director at the time, um, Bill McLaren was the, the PE teacher and of course uh, I had to go to Jim Telfer's, restu- uh, Jim Telfer's office and say look I've got this part time job as a dishwasher so I want to be a chef. And uh, he picked me up with the throat and said, you've got all your life to work, play rugby. So obviously ditched the rugby and became a chef. Lucky us. There you go. And uh, Eve, you set up your business from a hobby. Mm -hmm. When did you get into baking? So I think since I was young, I've always liked baking. I do think my mum probably liked my baking because I'm really messy. (laughs) Um, and then as you get older, I just didn't have enough time to do it. I was working full time, nine to five job. And then obviously lockdown happened um, and I was put on furlough. So I had all this free time to start baking. So I was doing lots of bits and bobs, baking for friends, family. Mm-hmm. Me and Michael, Michael put on like two stone in lockdown because <laughs> all my bakes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think lockdown's really where it all started for yeah. Fat Batch. I really got like the passion for baking really yeah. flourished. Cool. And when was it you decided to do Fat Batch? Was it like immediate overnight? You're like, I'm going to make money from no, this. No, so anymore. like we were doing a lot of cooking and baking, obviously in lockdown because there was nothing else to really do. Mm-hmm. Um, so we thought we'll just make like a little hobby page, like food blog page. So we did, and I wanted to call it Eve's Kitchen Nightmares to begin with, which is probably <laughs> more appropriate now. Um, but it's now called Fat Batch, obviously. Um, so we were just posting all our bits of cooking, baking, all that, and then I posted the brookie. And I think since that original post of the brookie, it's really where it changed from the food blog page to kind of where it is now, mm-hmm. and that's what really set us off. Um, and I think Aberdeen's a village. If one person would see it, and everyone would mm-hmm. see it. So I started getting messages for orders. I was very hesitant because obviously it wasn't my intention. Like I was still doing my nine to five job from home. So I wasn't really sure if it was something I wanted to do, but I ended up doing it. Um, and within honestly weeks, the page was just growing and growing. It got to a point that I was working my nine to five job and then baking until early hours of the morning right. every day to yeah. fulfill the orders. Um, I would say have like 40 boxes of four brookies available to collect. And within, I would post them on my Instagram story, and within a minute, they would sell. And that's where I thought, maybe this could be something, you know? So I thought, I can't put all my energy into my full-time job and Fat Batch. So I thought, I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to leave my nine-to-five office job. I'm going to do Fat Batch. Um, So, yeah, that's really where it took off. And then I wrecked my boyfriend's kitchen, chocolate (laughs) everywhere, flour everywhere. It was time to really get a brick-and-mortar premises. So... And we've been there for a year now, so know, yeah. Happy birthday, by the way. I know, just over a year now. I, I forgot to call them the caterpillar cake, but mm, I didn't think it would go down well. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex and Ruth, you've always had a big passion for wine for many years. You moved from Aberdeen to South Africa, start up your own seafood restaurant, Sea Breeze Fish and Shell. What brought on the move from Aberdeen to South Africa? Uh, well, <laughs> I think that's one for Ruth. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so we were running our restaurant, uh, Hornblowers, just south of Aberdeen in Gurdon. Uh, fab little spot, absolutely loved it, been there for five years. Um, can't say how much I love it enough. 
Um, but we were looking for our next spot. Um, we started looking at a venue down at the beach um, in Aberdeen to do our second hornblowers, and unfortunately that all fell through. So having sold hornblowers, we were thinking, right, you know, what's next? Take a break. So we were on holiday in Cape Town, trying to find a decent seafood restaurant. Could we find one? We were asking all the locals that we met, where's a decent seafood restaurant? Couldn't find one. So we identified a gap in the market, did three months um, as a recce in Cape Town, came back, got our visas, rented our house out, went and set up sea, sea breeze in Cape Town. So that was us for six years, and then COVID hit. Mm. And um, as with COVID, it's created um, opportunities, as Definitely, Eve just said, yeah. you know, it, it makes you creative. And the wine bar idea of selling um, South African wine back in Scotland was something we thought we'd be doing in about 10 years' time when we were ready to retire a bit and put the aprons up. COVID hit, it was the right time to do it. So we came back, left our team there, um, who are amazing, by the way. We've got a fantastic team in Cape Town. Um, I'll let Alex say a little bit more about them. Um, yeah, so we've got uh, 30 staff in Cape Town and the hardest thing for them was us leaving and the hardest thing for us was leaving them and we wanted to make sure that they were looked after and the only way we were ever going to keep the restaurant open was by coming back to the UK and being able to work over here because we got no government support there so we came back here, we were able to work, we were able to access funding and we were able to start up Sugarbird, and Sugarbird has kept 30 people employed through the, the tail end of COVID, uh, and all their families fed and watered, and that was really important to us. So yeah, we, we, you know, we, we made the move over there for the right reasons, which was we found a business opportunity, uh, that something we were comfortable in. Seafood restaurants has been our, my lifeblood since I was 16, and, uh, we've developed that into what is now Sugarbird Union Grove, soon to be in the gardens as well. Amazing. Great. And uh, you all had to start somewhere, and the food scene here in Aberdeen is something that's getting more diverse as the years go on. You all bring something different uh, to the city, um, but what's something that you think is missing currently? Kevin, do you want to kick us off with what you think? I'm not sure if there's anything missing, but I think what we really need is more locals or you know entrepreneurs that want to take yeah. the plunge like us mm -hmm. yeah. because there's a lot of you know brands out there that just snowball the the the, the, the small people as such yeah. and we need more independence we need more people to have a bit of balls just to do it because people will support you we've noticed that we've been open a year now and it feels like a month sometimes it feels like 10 years but i think we just need more independence that you know i'm not saying we all have to be the same but there's little different pockets of different food you can do um, and I think you know obviously we're looking at a, a second venue already just because we've identified a little market for us so um, and we're going to keep pushing our moves up the way um, as much as we can as much as Aberdeen can take it <laughs> um, because Aberdeen's a funny little place you know it's everyone goes out with a lot of money in Aberdeen but they all go away at the weekend mm -hmm. so yeah. we want to try and keep some people here and enjoy some nice wine and some nice food and yeah. you've all got and I think we all need to work together as such and don't 100%. be frightened to to help each other. I think yeah. that's the thing that we all need to do and just ask for help, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm certainly more independent is the thing that's missing, I yeah. think. Especially if you look at Edinburgh or Glasgow or, you know what yeah. I mean? Sure. Great. Alex and Ruth, anything you think is missing? Uh, yeah, just to follow up on Kevin's point, I think, you know, we've always said, uh, kind of being in the seafood business, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships. And you need to have everybody on board with you. You know, we were talking today about you know supporting local why don't we have to go with you know the the glass of port that's on our wine list or the glass of uh px sherry why not have a fat batch something sweet and delicious <laughs> rather than shopping out of aberdeen for it you know let's let's bring people on board with us yeah 100%. um and yeah bring everybody along with us so, so we like i know kevin does massively support local suppliers and local uh, producers uh, and that has to keep on continuing it's a great thing to support people on your menu mm -hmm. who do really good things locally because everyone will benefit from it um, 
on, on the other side of things, you know, I know Ruth's got something to say about what, what we're missing in the city from what she had when she grew up here. Okay, I've got two things. <laughs> no, my, my, I know what Alex is talking about. Um, I'm a graduate from Robert Gordon's hotel school. Um, did an HND in hotel catering and hospita hospitality management and a BA degree in hospitality management. And that, that does not exist anymore. And I think, it's, I think it's a shame. I really think it's a shame because I know from my year, I know from previous years, there were some really caliber people came out of those um, courses. Um, Hyatt Hotels recruited from Robert Gordon's degree um, class, bar none other university around the world. And um, I think I, I'm an example of what can happen from that, that um, background. The second thing I was gonna say, this might be controversial, but um, <laughs> I think we're missing a Michelin star. I think the Northeast yeah. could do with a Michelin star. Yeah. I, th I think the food's good enough. I think, Kevin, you're on your way there, you know. <laughs> no pressure, out. mate. But, <laughs> um, I, I think we need some Michelin stars up here. Yeah, I think that will. I know this is controversial because I think it can bring its own problems. Yeah. And I don't mean that. I mean to be on the food map. Um, and Aberdeen seems to have missed it. And I think we need to be on that foodie map. Um, food tourism, um, wine tourism, as, as we know from the Cape, it, it, it's a thing and we need to tap into that. We need to give people a reason to come up this corner of the, yeah. the Northeast. Yeah. And um, it is about attracting entrepreneurs. It is about attracting caliber people. Um, to come and do what yeah, they do. 100%. On that, Kevin, is <laughs> having a Michelin guide a curse or a saviour? Do you know, it was really good when we, you know, I was never dreamed that we, I mean, some people wait years to get in the guide, and we were in it in the first eight months, I think it was, and um, it, which was great, but it, it brings people from further afield to your restaurant, it really does, because if people are travelling to Aberdeen to, say, play golf or... Mm -hmm you know, whiskey, they'll go to the Michelin Guide and mm -hmm. say, oh, that's in the guide, it must be fairly decent. Mm -hmm. So I think it does help, and we had a, we did have a, a flurry of bookings when we went in. But then again, to, to get a star, I mean, we'd have to totally, not totally change, but we'd have to cut the numbers, which has lost revenue. But then on the, on the flip side, you'd have to charge more prices. And I think we're right. at our probably top end of price charges in Aberdeen for because people think we're expensive already, and if we've got to put another 50 quid on our menu, people's going to go, Pff. Yeah. People just don't get it yet, I think. Um, we've not got the footfall like Edinburgh or Glasgow. We've not got the tourists yet like Glasgow or Edinburgh. Um, so until we get to that stage, I think it'd be very difficult for anyone just to come in, and unless you've got a 10 seat restaurant and you've got two chefs, yeah. Um, it's very difficult to make the jump, and I think it does scare a lot of people. I mean, we scare we scare people off, and we're no we're not that fancy, but I think <laughs> we just want people to enjoy it and come through yeah. the door and just be relaxed. And but we've got this persona because I think I've got my name on the door, and I think oh, it must be must be fancy or it must be posh. And, but we're not really. We just do nice foods, local foods, um, and that's all we do. That's all we can do. And we don't. The, the, the thing, the key thing is don't go chasing stars, because the minute you do that, you're going to lose money left, right and centre, and it should just come naturally. I mean, we forget we're open here, so... And it is getting, we are getting better at the team we've had since day one. We've still got 90% of them, so it's about bringing them on mm -hmm. and making them feel relaxed as well, and how the journey goes on with them. You've got, everyone's got to move together to, yeah. to try and get that, so... Yeah, you never know. Never you know. You just never know. Who knows? <laughs> And Eve, anything you think is missing from the city just now? I think we're slowly but surely getting there. You know, all the um, like new food vendors have got approved down at the beach. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be really good yeah. and open up a lot of opportunities. I personally would like to see Union Street filled with a bit more personality, like more independent coffee shops, mm -hmm. restaurants, all that, because it's just really bleak. And I think if you're a tourist and you're going down Union Street, you're like... I'm not allowed to talk about it, but <laughs> what a shithole, basically, yeah. you know? Yeah. Which is a shame, because it never used to be like that, and it, it could be brought back to life. So that's what I personally would like to see. Yeah, I agree with you there. 
Um, so that was the rumblings before you started opening your businesses. Let's delve into those starting days. So Eve, you started baking through lockdown and yep. you touched on that you were selling through Instagram to your friends and things. Um, when the sales were kind of getting really popular and things were going really quickly, was your immediate thought, well, I could have a shop or did that kind of come later down the line? It definitely came later down the line. I kind of got to a point where I was like, where am I going with this? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. So I either put 100% effort into my full-time job, which I did actually enjoy, like my office job, or I put all my effort into Fat Batch. And I thought, you know, why not take the risk? Let's do Fat Batch. Let's see how it goes. I don't want to go, like, 20 years down the line and think, oh, imagine I had done that. What mm -hmm. could have happened? Um, so, yeah, I got to a point where I had taken on so much wholesale clients, custom orders and brookie boxes that I was mm -hmm. posting on my Instagram that there was just no space in my home kitchen. I had one oven, two little home mixers, and it's just, if I want to grow this, I can't do it from my Mental. boyfriend's kitchen yeah. anymore. So that was kind of the moment when yeah. I realised I needed a shop. You need to do it. Great. And, and I guess if there's a flat deposit in the mix, you'd want to keep his kitchen in check. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, did it seem like a massive risk taking that next step? to open up or did you just have full confidence that it was the right yeah, time? Yeah it was a risk but it was something I was definitely ready to do at the time like you know I liked my full time job but I was just so much more focused on doing that batch that I was like I can get this maybe sounds bad but you know if this doesn't go right I can maybe get another full time mm -hmm. job I won't get this opportunity again to yeah. do this Um yeah. And it's worked out? It's worked totally out worked so out. far, touch wood, but yeah, it's going It'll well continue so far. To. It will. And uh, what would be your advice to uh, any home baker or any person having a business who's reluctant to take that risk? Mm, it is a big risk. I think if it's something you want to do, my main advice would be if you're ready to take that step, hire a staff, have at least one other person to help you, I mm -hmm. think. Having, you know, when we first got the shop, I was adamant, I'm doing everything myself. I'm a control freak. So I was like, no, I'm doing all the baking. No one is helping me. <laughs> and then we were doing like 16, 17, 18 hour shifts. Crazy. It was too much. Mm -hmm. So that's when we got um, Chrissy to come in and help. So I think my main advice would be start growing a team, even if mm -hmm. it's just one person to help you. And then you can really yeah. pursue what you want to do. Were you giving off angry maw in the kitchen oh energy? My God. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, I do now, still to this day. <laughs> it hasn't gone. <laughs> it hasn't gone. <laughs> and Alex and Ruth, talking of risks, um, starting up a business at the best of time is a risk, but during a pandemic was when you decided to start up Sugarbird. Uh, why was that the right time for you? Why did you think it was the right time to do it then? I, I don't think we had a choice. Yeah. No, we, we, we didn't have a choice. Had to. Yeah, we had to. Yeah, we had to jump into it, uh, both feet first. We came back from Cape Town with uh, no money. Uh, we couldn't afford to send our cat back, let alone our furniture. Um, first thing I did was went through the, the loft and the shed and selling what we had and signed onto Universal Credit. Yeah. I mean, it was as, it was as, as tough as mm -hmm. that, running businesses through, through the pandemic. You know, everybody was scraping around for, for whatever you, you could do. Uh, but we knew that once we got back here, we could earn money here. We could go out to work. I went out to work. Uh, I went up to Balmoral to, to launch the new restaurant there. Um, and every penny that I got paid there went to paying the bills in Cape Town. Yeah. But we knew we could access cheap finance here to be able to do something that we wanted to do. And we knew that once we'd gotten through the pandemic, or the, or the, or the, the thick of it, even though it had been going on for far too long, we, we knew that a local neighbourhood wine bar was something that Aberdeen missed. Yeah. You know, we'd been out in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, in, in Dundee. You know, once again, Dundee's ahead of us mm -hmm. in, in opening wine bars. So we knew there was something there that, that we didn't have in Aberdeen. And we wanted to be somewhere close by. So uh, literally, we could have a drink and walk home if, if, if all else failed. And we knew that we could put our heart and soul into it and bring on board great wines from around the world mm -hmm. for someone else. And I think that's the key. We yeah. were very, very confident in the products. Yeah. You know, we were really exposed to the best vineyards, winemakers in the Western Cape for six yeah. years. So we were very confident in the product yeah. and the value that we could bring back to the wine bar. Yeah. I said yeah. no cat fights, but I think we nearly had one there with the mic. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, and I think all our, you know, our customers jumped on board from day one. The idea was it would be me and Ruth and one assistant, and now it's grown to a team of six, and as we'll come on to, uh, somewhere else as well. So, yeah, people are really bought into it. Yeah. It's fantastic, yeah. It's a great thing what you have built, and I was there the other week, uh, speakages before we did this, and I was saying it's like a perfect spot, really nicely laid out, and it's just a great part to have to make you come out of the city centre just go a little bit further up it's great and do you think starting up in lockdown with the ups and downs of all the different changes that made you more resilient to change for future business challenges yeah i think so i think as as entrepreneurs you have the ability to decide your direction of travel at any one time and i think you can take that point and decide what works for you what doesn't uh, you know, running restaurants, we, we know that if something sells, you keep on selling it. You know, you smell what sells. And if it doesn't, you pull it off and you do something else completely different. So you're used to be, you're used to ducking and diving and, and changing things up as you go along. Because at the end of the day, you're just so uh, aware of the money that comes through the door. Yeah. So if we have a wine that's on the wine list or, or on the shelves and it's not selling... We're like, you know, we've literally already bought and paid for that and we need to sell it now. Otherwise, you know, somebody's going to come knocking to pay. We have to pay it. Mm -hmm. We have to pay the bills. So you're always there working out how much money you can sell something for, what can you do to sell something, what do you need to do to do something to sell something. So, yeah, entrepreneurs are very light on their feet uh, out of necessity. Yeah. And did did you get the cat back? Did the cat yeah, come back? The cat. Thank God. I was worried. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, we got the cat back eventually. Good. Three months later and uh, more expensive than both of our flights back put together. So, yes. Yeah, as Worth much it. as you Worth love your it. children, we love our cat more. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kevin, you've recently celebrated the first birthday of Amuse. Um, why did you decide to open up on your own? That's a good question. I don't know why. But I think... <laughs> It's always, I never in the wildest dreams thought I'd have my own restaurant. And um, it's just because of the, the sheer cost, everything costs a fortune. It's a, it's a money pit, a restaurant. And during lockdown, it, it gives you time to think about things and seeds get planted. And it was actually my accountant said to me, he says, why, why don't you do your own thing? I said, that was stupid. <laughs> so then this property came up and I thought about it and then I went, no, I'm not going to do it. And then I thought I was going to do it. And then I, and I spoke to a really good friend of mine, and he says, well, okay, he says, if you don't do it, well, you're actually speaking about it, so you're going to do it. But if you don't do it, you're just going to reg- regret it. And I didn't want to have the reg- regrets. And he says, if it doesn't work, you'll just get another job somewhere. Mm-hmm. I'm quite sure. So you're only, you know, you're only, you only live once, as I say. So I just went, fuck it, I'm just going to do it. And by then, I was speaking to friends. I'm a member of the Academy of Culinary Arts, and I was speaking to a guy called Paul Askew, and she's got the um, art school in Liverpool. And I, was, I said to him, what do you think? He says, have you got your team in place? I says, yeah. I says, I've got 90% of my team in place. He says, well, you're 90% ahead of the game as it is because people just, people, businesses just, just can't get staff. Mm-hmm. And by that time, I had restaurant manager, bar manager, chef, me. And I thought, that's probably just need a bit of that. But we've actually got 20 staff now. And I was like, my God, it's amazing. So... That's how it all came about, and I think what's given me, and I think, I think if somebody gives you confidence, you can do anything you want. Mm-hmm. And I never had much confidence, and I think as soon as you get in and you get confidence, honestly, you can you can achieve amazing things. And and I've always said, well, what about pay slips? Who's going to do the pay slips? Who's going to do the accounts? But you just surround yourself with the right people, people that you can trust, mm-hmm. people that are better than you, um, and that's how it all came about. Great, and having like that push to do it and like thinking oh if someone else does it if I don't do it someone else will what other kind of support for businesses people who want to start a business do they need like is there other things that need to change in the restaurant scene anyway that I would change uh, that needs to change to help give more opportunities to I think, I think, I think the council would help mm-hmm. I mean we've not had any help the, the council have actually been a hindrance to us Mm. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not good talking shit. They, yeah. they have been. They're not. They have no support whatsoever. The SNP are a joke. Do you know what I mean? It's just a complete nightmare. Yeah. And you know, and it's not going to get any better. No. So yeah, we've just got to do it ourselves. And yeah. if we get 
power uh, through. Yeah, and but the local people support us. Mm -hmm. People that come through the door support us, and that's that's all we that's can do. Matters. Yeah. Great. And uh, so looking back at those months when you all first opened, imagine a lot of lessons learned along the way. Um, Alex and Ruth, what's been the biggest surprise for you guys since you started up Sugarbird? I think overall the biggest surprise is just how amazingly received it was right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. um, in my brain, when we were planning it, I thought the wine shop, was, the off-license part was going to be busy mm -hmm. and people popping in and out and the wine bar might have a couple of people popping in now and again and it's been the exact opposite mm -hmm. so the wine bar is full all the time which is brilliant Amazing. because that markets what we do in the wine shop um, so I'd say for me personally that was the biggest surprise mm -hmm. yeah, do you agree? Oh. And it, good. <laughs> and I guess for uh, for Eve and uh, Kevin, that they had kind of a social following before people. You were relatively well known, the chef, and you had your Instagram and stuff. And you guys were kind of new on the scene. Was that holding you back to an extent, or were you just like, we just need to just go for it and just see what happens? Yeah, I think we 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 saw what happened. You know, we were. The, the initial idea was it was something that Ruth and I could do with maybe one other person, mm -hmm. um, and that's changed completely mm -hmm. over time. So it's been brilliant, the, the take-up we've had. And as Ruth said, we thought that the big draw was going to be we've got, another, we've got a wine shop that does really cool independent wines in the West End, uh, and somewhere you can have a drink. But no, the, 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 the wine bar side of it is now two-thirds of the business. The, the retail is a third of the business. And that's just blown us away. And, and the appetite of our customers to learn and understand wine is phenomenal. That's really been massive. Our, our Wine Wednesdays are sold out almost now to the end of this year. Our Sparkling Saturdays are pretty much sold out as well. So yeah, people want to know about <coughs> wine and they, yeah. want to be, they want to be able to enjoy wine in a non-pretentious, cool, kind of chilled out yeah. vibe way. And that's kind of what we deliver. So it's, it's, okay. yeah, it's just been amazing. Yeah, our customers' ability to absorb new stuff has been super. Amazing. And talking of lessons, Eve, I imagine there's been a few baking mess-ups oh in the past. Yeah, What's, sure. uh, what tops your list for the worst one? So this is when I was still doing it from home. Um, and it was, I think it was maybe Mother's Day or Easter. It was like an occasion. So I took like 100 orders for like boxes of four. And everything went, every single thing that could go wrong went wrong. The oven stopped working, so stuff was coming out raw. And I was like, oh, this, this can't be happening. My, all my family were around helping me. Michael was going to ask at three in the morning to get ingredients and coffee from McDonald's. My auntie stayed until half five in the morning. So I thought, right, I made everything again. Next morning, everything's just raw because the oven's just not getting to temperature so I had to cancel and refund like a hundred boxes so that definitely that's one that sticks in my mind and it all was well for sure and what's the lesson learned from that um, it's hard it wasn't your fault it was yeah oven. don't don't use your home oven in your kitchen you get, <laughs> get an actual bakery <laughs> oven yeah. yeah that's what I would say heard it here first yeah uh, and Kevin you've worked in restaurants and hotels across the UK um, I'm sure you've many different working environments. What's been your biggest lesson learned over your time? Mm. Um, I think, I think people, I think, I think just working with different people. I think it's, um, I mean, kitchens are, can be quite harsh. I mean, I was at Savoy obviously for four and a bit years and you'd start at six in the morning and finish at 11 at night, half an hour break. But I think it's just, I think, you know, you can have the best place in the world, you can have the best building in the world, but I think it's, if you've got the right people, it'll, it'll certainly work. Yeah. People, people are the key. Um, and as a city, we talk about, well, we're no stranger to people talking about bad decisions that have been made for the city and people like to moan and complain. But what's been a development or project or change in the city that you think has been a positive one? Alex and Ruth, do you want to kick off with that one? Positive change to the city, um, just kind of more of an upbeat vibe around the city. Uh, not, you know, things are happening. Things are there that are really good. I think 
Uh, big up to the, all the guys down at the beach who are doing an amazing <laughs> job down there. Yeah. Yeah. They're doing a fantastic, fantastic job to bring people down the beach. We forget, we you know, we are a city by the sea. Mm-hmm. And just because we don't have that, you know, direct connection of being able to walk from the city centre, well, we do, but, you know, it's a bit of a schlep. But, you know, it's, it's not there right on your doorstep. We're not built around the, the beachfront. Those guys down at the beachfront who are doing an amazing job down mm-hmm. there, you know. It's great. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Eve? I'm probably touching on the same as mm-hmm. these guys here, the whole beach thing. I, I don't know why it would have ever been opposed in the first place. I think it's really good that so mm-hmm. much different variety of small businesses are, you know, are now allowed to go down there. Um, and I think it'll open up so many opportunities for them and also for the city if they then, you know, open up a shop. It opens up jobs for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also think Resident X has been a really good feature for mm-hmm. the city as well. Um, yeah, with all the different food bits and the bar, I think that's been really good too. Definitely. Yeah. Great. And Kevin, anything? Yeah, I mean, this is, this, this is the first time I've been here. It's, it's really cool mm-hmm. and it's a great area, this. But I think it needs to be, put, you know, we need to put that onto Union Street. I think mm-hmm. Bob's doing a great job, a local border, a local border native, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, he's doing a great job. I think we should buy a thousand power washers and just go up and down Union Street yeah. <laughs> and just get, get it cleaned. Because that would help. Yeah, 100%. Um, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I think we just need to work together and, and just get this place cleaned up because it's beautiful granite we've got. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if we get the place looking good, I think people will come. And as I say, if you build it, they'll come, I think. Yeah, 100%. We'll all grab our marigolds and get yeah. scrubbing one weekend. Yeah. We'll do that for the next Sun- podcast. Sunday power wash. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so from those opening days to where you are now, you've all got different perspectives on running businesses, I'm sure. Um, Eve, looking back at lockdown, how does it feel to be where you are now from yeah. starting from home to being open? It's a surreal feeling. So obviously, this time, like three years ago, I was still working my nine to five job, um, and we were in like the peak of lockdown. Um, so to think, you know, in the space of three years that I've gone from that to running a wee home bakery to now Google shops, a really surreal feeling. It might kind of appear like, oh, this happened by accident. She made a few bakes and it went well, but so much hard work. Mm-hmm. Been of course, yeah. It from both me, Michael and our own team, family obviously. So surreal and really proud of how far we've all had mm-hmm. to get to the point where we're at now. And to think like when, not long after you first opened, I remember you having like the two bake rule, you could only get, or three bakes. Oh, yeah. we had you had to, to limit like ration yeah, we orders. <laughs> open at eight, we used to open at eight, and then honestly by nine o'clock we'd be sold out. It's so crazy. we had to then start limited to like three people three bakes per person and then there would be families that would get the husband to go up and get three, yeah. the wife would go up and get three, yeah. the kids would go up yeah. and get three. But yeah, I know. I hate to say so, we were we were that family. Yeah, yeah, like, I love it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> like we live around the corner and we'd be like, Get up, go! <laughs> get out <laughs> And uh, what's a bit of advice you wish someone told you before you started up? Um, this is yeah, for sure. So I think there's gonna be a lot of positive days but there's also going to be negative times hard times and i think you know that's fine that's what comes you've got in a small business and starting up a new business is that there's going to be challenging times and nothing goes to plan ever and nothing mm-hmm. straightforward um and that's okay that's yeah. going to happen and it's not like that one bad day or that one negative experience define you or you know let that ruin all the hard work that you put into creating this mm-hmm. and that's something that i still try and listen to you know, getting better and being more resilient and there's not a lot of ne- negativity that happens at that much but if there is something i'm trying so hard not to let it consume me mm-hmm. um, but it is hard to hard when you're passionate about it yeah, as well you just want it to be exactly. the best you want it to be the best and you don't like if somebody's maybe not thinking it's five star yeah it's definitely five star. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and kevin i guess when you open up a museum you're kind of key milestones of what you thought you would hit in the first year was being on the Great British Menu one of those milestones did you expect to feature on that? <laughs> well that came out the blue to be honest you know I was so focused on the restaurant we know just only opened three months um, we got the phone call thinking asking if I'd like to do it and then so they put it into a pot and then I don't know how to do it obviously um, and then I got the phone call a week later to say that I'd been selected which was amazing and I thought and they said, well, give me a couple of days to think about it. I was like, hmm. 
but you know, it's, it was so good for business. Yeah. I, I couldn't turn it down. But the, the hardest thing for me was try to practice every night and open up a business and run a business yeah. and run a kitchen and make sure all the staff were okay. You know, I was in the kitchen till sometimes two, three in the morning practicing, and then in again at nine, prepping for the restaurant. Yeah. So, people, we touched on it earlier. People don't realise the work that goes down in the back in the background. Yeah. You know, it takes us three months to put a moose together. You know, me, Nicola, and Michael came on board later. Matthew. So there's four of us in my kitchen just thinking about you know playlists, cut cutlery, crockery, mm -hmm. ovens. You know, it's just an amazing thing to put together. And I think because that, we had that three months. Um, we were well prepared to do that, and that allowed me, helped me to do the Great British Menu. Okay. And was the experience what you expected? Was it? Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah. You know, I unfortunately, never got to the to the last day, but I think um, the BBC were fantastic. Uh, you know, making sure you were okay and you weren't too stressed. And obviously, it's quite a it's quite a stressful. Mm -hmm. It's because when the cameras are running, they're running. There's no like stop for breaks or. Yeah. There's no timeline to say, oh, oh I'll just stop this, Andy. Yeah. But I think I was quite relaxed. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but I was actually cracking jokes with Andy all over. And I forget, I was, you know, there was a thing on one of the pod, one of the things that a, a siphon gun went, <laughs> and I, I just said, oh, excuse me. <laughs> and of course, I just forget, totally forgot I was doing things like that. But, and I think that made me relax a little bit. Um, but the pressure was on. I mean, I was up against, you know, Adam handling a world class chef, yeah. which was. Um, which was tough against him, but I think, you know, hopefully if I get back this year, um, he'll be at the equation. So uh, <laughs> you just never know. I might, never I might get through. So never yeah, know. it was a great experience, and it was good for business. And yeah. Um, yeah, I enjoyed it. Was there anything you would do differently that you were thinking after that maybe didn't go to plan or at Great British Menu or yeah, Great British Menu? Uh, yeah, yeah I think uh, I think I did play it a bit safe, but you just didn't know what you were going into. A lot yeah. of these guys have been there. You know, Madam's been there three or four times, so. And he, he had a lot of stuff prepared, so I went quite quite um, cold as such. So I think I'll be certainly more prepared and um, more organised as such. Because, you're, you know, if I've been honest, you're 90% thinking about a moose and 10% about thinking... Because you think, it's oh, I've got to do this done, I've got to get it done. But it's such a big show. I don't know what the, what the number is, but if we get it right this year, it just opens so much doors for, for, yeah. for the team at Moose and, and even for Aberdeen, you know, it, it does put Aberdeen on the map yeah. um, and I think even through the restaurant now, I think people are kind of say that you can the biggest thing, people just look at you you're like, oh, that's him that was on the Great British menu <laughs> and it's a bit weird but it's it's good for business and I yeah. think it's good for Aberdeen ultimately and I think, you know, it's, if I get on this year, I think it'll be hopefully a bit better We'll all be tuning in <laughs> and uh, Alex and Ruth, we touched on when you guys opened up Sugarbird, you were new to the scene, no social following or anything, and but you've quickly built a community around you, which is apparent in your recent news that dropped a few weeks ago about your new wine bar. Do you want to fill the audience in on what we can expect from the new news? Uh, yeah, so if anyone's not heard, we're at a new bar in Union Terrace. Uh, um, so... Thank you. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all a, it's all quite a little bit crazy because we've been working on it for a very long time and uh, love or hate the council and I know we all pay into it, so you probably hate them, but we've been all working behind the scenes for a very long time on this. So that they couldn't come out and and say what was happening. And neither could we, but we, we are super excited about it. As I was saying to somebody earlier, one, one, of, our, one of our regular customers, who was just like gushing, I was like, this is gonna be Sugar Bird Plus. This is, this is what you want from Union Grove, extra. It's reservations, in, for some of it, don't get too excited. We're not having you book tables in a wine bar, it's a wine bar. But you can do parties, we can do events, um, and we're, we're in, if it, hands up, just a quick straw poll, because not everyone's been down there. Who's been to Union Terrace Gardens in the last, say, two weeks? Hands up. Uh, 30%? Generally, 35%. Um, if anyone's not been down there recently, I have to be honest, since they laid the turf and the flowers have started coming out, it looks stunning. Yeah. It looks really, really good. And I recommend 
just go down there, grab a coffee from Common Sense or any of the other independent coffee providers nearby and sit in the gardens or grab your lunch and take it down there and enjoy it. Go down the slide as well yeah. and the musical uh, instrument so, yeah. pods as well, they're good. So yes, yeah, so we're really looking forward to opening Sugarburn in the gardens yeah. in November. Woo. Yeah. Woo. Woo, woo, woo. And you are doing crowdfunding for that as well. So yes. how much is it you're yeah, going we, to Yeah, we're doing crowdfunding. Um, th- this is really important to us. It, it, hospitality has had the toughest time for over the last three years. And we've been at the thick end of it, not only just here, but in, in other places as well. It's been incredibly hard to access funding for hospitality businesses particularly in Aberdeen over the last while. Aberdeen gets kind of down marks, it's like grey listed if you want to go and borrow money from a bank. So we have this fantastic opportunity, we're going to do something amazing in Union Terrace Gardens, this beautiful fresh spot in the city from a business that works really well where we are in Union Grove. You take that to a bank and I'm literally talking to somebody in a call centre in Stratford because there is nobody in Aberdeen to talk to about borrowing money. And, you know, you either... I would be interested if both Kevin and Nevi about their experiences about setting up their businesses. You, you either need landlords with very deep pockets, you need very, or very deep pockets yourself, or you bootstrap it. And that's what we did with Union Grove, we bootstrapped it. And the crowdfunding means that you can support us in bringing an amazing thing to the city centre. But you also get 25% on top of what you put in. You, you know, it's like the anti-cost of living crisis for wine. You, know, you get you get 25% extra wine or 25% extra on your party that you're gonna have with us next year. So the crowdfunding is really, really important to us. It, 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 it will help make it happen. This is gonna happen anyway. But you, you guys, everyone that supports us so far has been amazing, uh, from corporates to individual people, and you get to win a trip to South Africa. So you know you've got a pretty fair chance of forty from forty quid upwards winning a trip to South Africa. Good. And how much was it you're looking to raise again? How much are you looking to raise? Uh, the target is hundred thousand. Yeah. We're very well on our way towards Good. that. Great. And um, I know some of our marketing team are here tonight. She no pressure, guys. I yeah, know, she will hopefully won't throw a glass at me, but we will be closing the crowdfunder at the end of July. Oh, wow. Because we don't want to get oversubscribed. So, Amazing. Yeah. Oh, get in or miss out. Yeah. <laughs> Just one additional thing that was really important, important to us about the crowdfunding is... We recognise what the centre of Aberdeen has been for quite a long time and um, it was obviously a a really bold move for us to decide to go into the centre of town. But the crowdfunding, what that also does is buying customers' loyalty to commit to coming into Aberdeen and to spend their money in the city centre and to help generate not just us but all the ancillary businesses around us, restaurants, other bars, and to help start creating that vibe again that's been missing for such a long time. Um, So that was also part of the thinking of crowdfunding, which is just a piece of the whole funding for the whole venue. Yeah. I think it's good as well what you've done with the crowdfunding, that you've started it with packages starting from £40 upwards, because make it accessible to people who can't, because sometimes they always start, crowdfunding usually starts at 100 and you're like, ooh. I mean, I'd love it if there was a thousand people at 40 quid. Yeah. Because that's a thousand people yeah. coming in spending 40 quid. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. 100%. You just remind me, I still haven't got mine yet, so I need to do that. <laughs> I said that last time. I was like, I'll do it. I will do it. I'll be quick. I'll be quick. Um, great. So, we are rustling through it. So, it's a food safari time. I can't actually remember if I said anything about the food safari when I started, did I? I'm seeing nods from Rachel. Yes, we did. Okay, so I don't need to cover that. Um, so we've oiled the wheels and we're ready to set off. Alex and Ruth, you've been tasked with starting us off with your starter location. Where are you taking us and what are you ordering? So, starter, food safari. So, I assume this was anywhere in Scotland. Yes, anywhere in Scotland. Um, time, travel, petrol does not exist. You can just go anywhere. Okay. doesn't matter. Well, 
We're not going too far down the road, but That's we good. are going a wee bit out of town. That's fine, yeah. So we're going down the A92 and we're heading towards Inverkeela. So down in Inverkeela is possibly the best destination restaurant that we've been to that nobody, not enough people have ever heard of. Mm -hmm. And it's a wee place called Gordon's in Inverkeela. So you, you go past our breath, you get your smokies and you keep on going. <laughs> And there's a fantastic restaurant with rooms called Gordon's in Inverkeela. And it was named after a fantastic chef, Gordon uh, Watson, and his uh, wife, his widow, Maria, and their son, Gary, who worked with them, uh, has carried on the legacy of what Gordon's done. Uh, we go there to celebrate special occasions, to just get away, uh, the food is outstanding, the accommodation is wonderful, and the environment is fantastic. So, his cheese souffle is amazing. Double baked cheese souffle is amazing. But nice. his pre starter of a duck liver mousse, mm. paired with, I have to bring some wine into it. <laughs> so, some Hungarian Tokai, which is the natural sweet wine of, of Hungary, like honey on the tongue. Uh, just pairs beautifully with the duck liver mousse and yeah so we're heading down to Inverkeela for our Beautiful. stop great you both agree I was going to say if you've got well, an extra starter you can put it in we both said where would you go Gordon's yeah look at Gordon's, that yeah. match made in heaven and uh, Eve you've been set a task for our main course it does not need to match it doesn't need to make any sense calories don't count either so we've got room we've got room where's your Scottish so food find we went away in a camper van two years ago. Like we came to like North Coast 500 sort of way. Mm -hmm. One of our last places was Lockinber, and they're famous for like, their pies and mm -hmm. stuff. But we went to this like outdoor restaurant. It was kind of peak COVID, so it was all outdoor and stuff. And they had like a seafood truck sort of thing. I'm not big on seafood, but we thought we're here. It was literally caught across there. We might as well try lobster. So we did, and it was absolutely beautiful. And I'm again, I'm not a seafood person. Neither of us are, but it was stunning. And I think. Why it sticks in my head is because there you use such a nice explanation. The restaurant mine is not. <laughs> so there was a table across from us with two um, like an elderly couple and the, the guy drank two bottles of wine, finished his food, got in his car and drove home. And you were like, I don't think that's I don't think you're right. meant to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, that's where we'd go. And we had the dog with us as well. So it was just nice. really nice and it was like finished off our trip for us. Great. And then when you're hungover after you can get pie. The pie mm. shop. Great, yeah, that is a good idea. What yeah. pie would you go for from the pie shop? Said pie. What is the pie shop called? Do you know? I think just the, the pie shop. The pie shop in Lockinger. <laughs> Lockinger pies, maybe. Um, probably just a mince pie, standard yeah. steak or mince pie, nothing too fancy. Yeah, just stick to what you know. Just stick to what I know, or a cookie pie. Oh, mm. the mm. cookie pies. <laughs> like it and Kevin you're tying us off with dessert where is your must dine spot in Scotland for dessert well I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have a dessert because I love cheese uh, oh, so, but controversial. there's so many great cheese producers in Scotland mm -hmm. there's a beautiful one down in um, Ayrshire called it's, it's called Ailsa Craig it's just a little goat's cheese which is absolutely fantastic and you've got the, the lovely cheese in Arran so, I mean, I would love just to take a camper van and just go around all these little cheese places. Yeah. Obviously, I can't cut the bottles of port in the back. Great. And just just because I think we forget that it's such a great produce of cheese, you know, because we get caught up in the, the beef and the lamb and the shellfish we've got. Mm -hmm. But cheese is there's some world class cheeses in Scotland. 100%. And speaking of cheeses, if we're going to do a cheese board or a charcuterie board, what would you guys pair on that? What would be the what's perfect kind of setup for that? <laughs> I want to say it's tough, but it's not, because there are like rules you stick by. Oh. So, Tennis. yeah, I'm going to make you do this. You know, I always say about wine, there are no rules, but, you know, sometimes there, there are rules, right? So, uh, Campbell Brie, champagne, mm. or sparkling wine. Right. Uh, blue cheese, go with something sweet. Port works because it's got the sweetness of the added alcohol to it. Uh, cheddar, you want to go uh, smoky and oaky, so something big, rich, Cabernet Sauvignon, Bordeaux, uh, goat's cheese, Sauvignon Blanc, perfect, perfect match for okay. that. Yeah. And, and I couldn't agree more with what Kevin said, 
the, the, the quality of cheese in Scotland is second to none. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. You know, we'll always have, we've got Strathdon Blue at the moment mm -hmm. on the cheese board. That with a, a sweet wine is absolutely knockout. This did get me thinking though, kind of off paste with a really decent food pairing. Uh -huh. Fish and chips mm. and Blanc de Blanc. Oh! Every time, it's a winner. <laughs> Game changer. Oh, he yeah, can. You know, people, you got easy pairings, you go Indian, you go Riesling or a pint of lager. <laughs> <laughs> But fish and chips, get some fizz out of your fridge and have fish and chips with champagne, particularly char sparkling Chardonnay or a Cremant, absolutely knock out. Fish and chips and, and fizz. A special fizz tomorrow at the Moose. I was going to yeah. say, yeah. yeah. I was going to say either... Fish Friday. <laughs> fish Friday. I was going to say Fish Friday at your place or Cheese and Wine School. It's one of those lines. That's it. Great. Well, that's a fair foodie travel there. Um, so we're nearing the end of the panel and I just wanted one last question before we open the floor to the audience tonight. Um, how do we get people talking about Aberdeen in a more positive light? Kevin, do you want to kick us off? <sighs> how long have we got? <laughs> I think just doing what we're doing mm -hmm. and what this place does and what you people do. I think we just need to be ourselves and I think we need to, I think we need to believe in ourselves. I think we need more support from councils, we need more support from the government. I think, you know, Aberdeen, I think it's a bit like we're um, from Hoyk, and I think back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, Hoyk was a bit, you know, it was a really great bustling town with a knitwear. I think the council at the time didn't want any more business in because they've got enough business here. Aberdeen's exactly the same with oil. They didn't want any more business in because they think they're great with oil, and now it's getting me bite them in the bum because the oil was kind of obviously, in the last 10 years, has been decreasing away. So we need to try to re regenerate Aberdeen, I think, but they should have done it 10 years ago. So I think we just need to believe in, you know, ourselves and how good we are and how we can we can bring other people on. You know, we've got a young team, we want to bring them on and then, mm -hmm. you know, do another place, then bring them on. And it'll just snowball and I think we just need to, yeah, be ourselves, I think. Yeah, definitely. Eve, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think the, I think the council should make it, stop putting hurdles in front of you know small businesses and make things easier for us for example we've now got our tables and chairs outside and it was so hard to just get permission to do that right you know in your past from pillar to post pillar to post you know who do we speak to we need to speak to this person to speak to this person it's just not helpful and i think we should just make things so much easier and so much you know more accessible for small, small businesses yeah. to grow Definitely. Um, and you know when we first started I inquired like is there if there was any grants or small business loans and there was just nothing available mm -hmm. for small businesses so you know if you don't have savings or you don't get a loan then it's really holding you back from yeah. doing what you want to do yeah Definitely. Yeah. when you think of the pavement space outside that batch I it's massive yeah exactly but we're there now we've got our yeah. tables and chairs so you we're won. You won. Yeah. we had exactly the same problem we, we yeah. bought chairs and parcels and you know, Nicola was tasked to, to try and find out who we had to speak to. Yeah. We're not getting anywhere. So she says, bugger it. We've put them Let's out. And within three weeks, somebody, oh, we're from the council. Went, ah, you're the person we need to speak to. <laughs> so that's what you do. You need to do it and then wait for them to come. Yeah, that's so what you do. <laughs> Great. It's uh, a lot easier to ask for forgiveness rather yeah, than Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. Alex and Ruth, what would you say? You need, you need to do to talk about the city more positively. I think there's a lot of positivity around the city at the moment. Yeah. I think... Um, you know, people are bigging up Aberdeen again, and it's really good to good to hear and good to see and good to feel about. I think we we all have it in us to, to do that. We we all have it in us to shop locally, to choose to go to Mount rather than to go to Starbucks, mm -hmm. to choose to drink here rather than to choose to drink at All Bar One, uh, to choose to eat at Muse rather than to eat at Mount Maison. You know, all right, we all employ. All of those businesses employ people in Aberdeen, but not all of those businesses support and pay tax locally, support the local economy, mm -hmm. support businesses that supply us locally, mm -hmm. and those are the ones that matter. You know, we had a real big policy at our last restaurant, uh, just south of it, that we only spend our money within 50 miles of where we were, mm -hmm. and that had a real massive knock-on effect because it meant that the people that 
you supported, supported other businesses around you and supported their families as well. So I think, you know, Aberdeen, is, you know, it's always said Aberdeen is a village, and it, and it is, mm -hmm. but in a village, you shop within your village. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, occasionally you get a treat and go to the big town, yeah, but if you want to make a difference, shop locally, spend your money locally, and put the pressure on people you shop with locally as well. You know, you can drink Peroni Zero because these guys serve it here, but why not say to them, why not serve Fierce Zero? And that supports the people at Fierce, who then support their families, and then support the brewery in Dice. You know, there's enough craft beer breweries going bust at the moment, but you know, they need the help that everyone else does. Yeah. So yeah, shop as locally as you can, support as locally as you can, and do as much as you can for your local environment. And be, be the person that makes the change. That's yeah. what I'd say here. There you go, great. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we kind of touched on it, like peppered throughout the conversation about kind of collaboration and pairing up with other uh, food businesses. Is that something that surprised you when you started up the the willingness for people businesses to collaborate with other businesses? So it's something when I started the podcast, I was really I, from an outsider. You kind of think, oh yeah, everybody's want to keep it to themselves, keep their secrets. But it's very apparent in Aberdeen that there is that every sharing, skating, support local, support each other. Is that something that surprised you all when you started up? Yeah, I mean, we we were really surprised because we started uh, working with um, Fair Cairns, um, the whiskey distillery. And it came through a, a, a really good, nice guy who used to... Well, what, I didn't even know White Mackay was what he's owned by. Um, Fertig, or Fertig, you know, is owned by White Mackay. So they came in, had a few whisky uh, pairings with us, and they liked it so much we've done a, a collab. So they've actually invested in the best part of nine to 10,000 quid in a lovely whisky cabinet, which is in the restaurant, uh, but just got finished last week. Um, so they'll host two or three dinners uh, a month, and they'll be bringing people up from France, well, I think that we've done France, Scandinavian, German, London, and it's all people that you're bringing up to market fair cairns, and then they'll have their dinner at Moose and we'll do like a five course taste menu with whiskey. So, you know, that's really it just came out of nowhere. And I think you've got to set your bar here mm -hmm. and you just go and just go and do it, you know, and just go and try and do this. I mean, it always reminded me when I used to work for a guy called Anton Mosserman years ago, and he had a place, a church in Bulgaria. And he was so ahead of his time. Like, he had this church, and it was, you know, he'd have a Mont Blanc room. It was just two seats. But he got Mont Blanc to pay for it. You know, he had the Bentley room, which was, you know, a Bentley, it was an oak table with Bentley seats from the car. You know, gear stick was a door handle. And I always remember to do that, to do little collabs. And we were started already with Fert Cairns, so it's amazing. There you yeah. go. Great. Alex and Ruth, did that surprise you collaboration? Did it surprise you when you started? I think you, sometimes you have to say no to things that aren't right for you. Sometimes you have to go and look for things. And sometimes you feel a little bit like imposter syndrome and I don't want to put my head above the parapet by being involved with somebody that's better than me. You know, there, there are so many great businesses locally and you're like, do I deserve to be working with them? And I think sometimes you'll say, look, let's work together and get something over the line <coughs> to, to make us both benefit. Um, so I think you can be humble, but you need to have an objective and a focus. And it's how is this going to translate into sales for both of us? Yeah. Uh, and at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. We're, you know, the, these, we're, we're, we've got businesses, and we need to make things work that, that work on a business level for all of us. So I think, you know, to work with Evie, to put some of her product, if there's any left, <laughs> on, our, on our list to, to pair up with a port or a dessert mm -hmm. wine is going to be amazing. Uh, it, you know, if that sort of thing works for her. But it's really important to find the right collabs mm -hmm. and do the right things at the right time for, for you as a yeah. business. And not to take on too much as well. Business is really hard when you're entrepreneurs. You don't have a massive support network of marketing departments, uh, finance departments, everything else around you. So you do have to be quite uh, picky in what you can do with your time. You know, as Kevin said, you know, you did an amazing job with Great British Menu, but 
that comes at a cost to your life and to what you can do yeah. with, with that time that you have. Yeah. Eve? Yeah, I think if business complement each other, there's no reason that a collaboration won't work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, the early stages of Fat Batch, we had like a Brookie ice cream with another mm -hmm. local ice cream company. Mm -hmm. That's obviously going to work as Brookies and ice creams mm -hmm. when we were well together. And then, kind of touching on imposter syndrome as well, um, Aberdam approached um, us when the shop wasn't even open yet, but we were still doing it from the, the house. And I was very like hesitant, you know, is my stuff good enough for these guys? Yeah. And you know, it's like, well, you've got to give it a go and try. And if you don't do mm -hmm. that, then you're never going to know. Yeah. Um, and obviously, brookies, cookies, burgers, chips, it's mm -hmm. going to go hand in hand. Yeah. And it's worked and it's doing really well. But yeah, again, it's, it, it can be hard to know what things to go for. We've been approached yeah. by quite a few like giveaways and we'd like to be a part of so much stuff. We've just got to think, is that right for my business? Mm -hmm. And yeah. my sort of, you know, image, so to speak, and, you know, pick and choose what's right for you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Fantastic. Well, that is us at the end of my questions. We're going to open up the floor. For anyone who's got a question, if there is anyone, raise your hand and shout out loud and proud so we can hear you. Any questions? Great, we've got one right at the front. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to summarise in my head, but I'll get it done. It's fine. It's all right, I'm on it, I'm on it, I'm listening. So is there an association locally, like the Hotel Association, for food and drink businesses, for when big events come to Aberdeen to help you guys tie in and get opportunities out there? Uh, yeah, there we go. Kevin? I think we were just started working with um, Visit Aberdeen. I think mm -hmm. they, they kind of help us. And they, we, are, we went to a workshop last week to try and find route to market and then markets to us. So I think, yeah, I mean, use the podcast maybe. Um, Come on, Alan. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no, we've been just so focused on what we do and try, trying to build up. But we're... Year two, we're looking at different routes to market and how we can do things and how we can get people through the door. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, it'd be really, really helpful if we can. Maybe we should set one up. <laughs> there you go, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, great. Alex and Ruth, anything to add to that? Well, there's a Facebook group where everyone bitches about everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Spill. Uh, and What's a, it and a WhatsApp group as well. But no, there isn't, and uh, and there should be. Um, and to touch on what you were saying about events, I'm involved in the Our Union Street project uh, uh, on the event side, and being, you know, my, my remit is about what events do we have in the city, how do we know about them, and how can we reach out to them, and that, that is, you know, how do people know about what's, happened to, what's happening here tonight? Uh, there is no central source for all of those things happening in the city. And there are so many opportunities that, that local vendors miss out on mm -hmm. or don't have the opportunity to be involved with, whether it's because of the council, whether it's because of the event organisers, or whether it's because we just have no knowledge of any of these things. So, yeah, there's a massive knowledge gap in the city. And for a small city, yes, we should know about it. And the, the, I'm, it's great that one of the things that the Our Union Street Projects is focusing on is events and knowledge around those events. So... Yeah, you're, you're absolutely spot on with what's happening at the moment. Amazing. Eve? Yeah. Eve and Dad? I would 100% agree. Like, we're in a position now where we'd like to do a lot more stalls and events that we can and things like that. But we're kind of at a point where we're waiting for people to approach us because we don't actually know what is available mm -hmm. for us to be able to go to. So we could be doing stalls every weekend if we knew they were there. But we, we don't know where to go or e who even to contact about them. Yeah. So it's kind of just waiting for people to get in touch with us. So, yeah, yeah it's a good point, to be honest, yeah. So anyone in the audience has an opportunity coming up, get in touch yeah. or tag directly and you'll find out. <laughs> Any other questions? Got one over here? Uh, so sure Great. So just for a listener at home, so we've been asked a grueling question about <laughs> what it's like to work with your other half. So Sugarbird Wines is Alex and Ruth, our <laughs> couple, and Fat Batch is Michael and Eve. Question time has started. How is it, Eve? <laughs> Shite. No, <laughs> no, it's really good. To begin with, oh, like that was a big fear because like we literally spend every second together. We're together all the time. We only have one car now, so we drive to work together. Like it's a lot. Intense. But like over time, we've done this for a year now. We're getting to the stage where we know what bugs each other, and it's like 
just we can calm this down quickly, you know. Um, but it's also really good, you know, like, it's because we live together as well, we can bounce ideas off each other all the time. We can just speak about things all the time. So it, it, there's going to be highs and lows, obviously. It's hard, and it's hard to kind of find time to switch off from work. We always find that we'll both come home. Michael sits on his phone, I'm sitting on my mm -hmm. phone, and we won't speak for hours because that's our downtime. Yeah. And on our day off, like, we either... Like, I like to do things. I like to be up and about and being active. And Michael just likes to chill in his bed, and that's fine. You know, I'm allowing him to have his time, and he's allowing me to have his time. He just loves the PlayStation. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Perfect. Alex and Ruth, what about you guys? <laughs> oh, this is going to be good. <laughs> it, it's so funny, because when I met Amy and Michael, as we were coming in to do a little intro to each other, I, I said, as you guys work together, how's that? How's yeah, that? yeah. Because we've been working together since 2010, and we actually met each other in 1993 um, in the same hotel we worked in in London. So we've known each other and worked with each other for a very long time. Um, it, I think we're in our rhythm now, and it's, it's just second nature. Yeah. It's not always the fan fantastic mm -hmm. it, it's not it just isn't um you have to draw a line between work and your personal life but i think we're at the stage now where actually our businesses are our babies there's no two ways about it our our businesses are our babies we don't actually have children we've got our cat but <laughs> Our businesses are our babies, so it is what we talk about, it is what we are passionate about, it is what we are exploring and developing, and just everything, all mm -hmm. the time. Um, and our downtime is going to different areas of the world, exploring wine farms <laughs> and vineyards, so... Nightmare. It's enjoyable, yeah. we love yeah. it, and, um, but it, it is, it's just part of our life. So I guess it comes down to that old phrase, you'll never work a day in your life when you're doing what you love. So okay. that work-life balance just becomes who you are. Alex? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, no, Ruth's <coughs> absolutely right. It, you know, you, you have your ups and your downs, but you're both pulling in the same direction. And that's really important that, you know, whatever team you have, if, you, if you're not all pulling together to go in the right place, then there's always going to be friction. There's always going to be tension. Uh, all, all the things we, we've done together, we've kind of agreed on as they've happened, whether it's been... Uh, uh, the restaurant in Cape Town, it's like, we're like, oh, we're busy negotiating a lease. Oh, are we actually doing this? Oh, yeah, I suppose we're better. Oh, we're going to open in Union Terrace. Uh, are we doing this? Yeah, okay, well, we seem to be. So, you know, it all pull, pulls you in the right direction. That you, If you both agree on it and you both want to do it together, then it moves in the right direction. And definitely knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So I can't do everything he can do and he can't do everything I can do and we respect that and yeah. that's I mm -hmm. think how yeah. you get on with it yeah and assignment of re responsibilities as well that's really important you know we're, we're running businesses you know we've got nearly 50 odd staff uh, between us it's unfair on them to not be 100% behind what we do uh, so we have to be we have to be delineated we have to be organised, we have to be professional, and we have to deal with all the things that, that people who you employ and you work with and you care about will want to know about and want to be working, yeah. <laughs> I know. And at the end of the day, the woman's always right, so that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Kevin, is it a similar setup with, you know, business partners and the same love language that you've got to have with them, or...? I'd just, I'd just like to say first, can you imagine if you ever fell out, imagine the cake fight. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think for me it's it's the other way. Like I've sacrificed a lot being at the restaurant and don't see my wife and the kids. I think it's that's really sacrificed thing. But I've got a great team in in the restaurant now. You know, been working together a year, 
and you know we've done we've had 70 people booked tonight and i've left the restaurant you know after we've Thank done you. the first 30 <laughs> rushed here and you've just got to give your trust in them because if you don't you would just go mad you know you know i'm a bit of a control person as well but i've learned that you, you can't do it all mm -hmm. and you've just got to let let these guys flourish because if you don't they'll never progress yeah and they'll get bored and so you've got to give them a bit more um responsibility 100 percent I think we've got time for one last question, if it is. Oh, Claire Gordon, hello. So other than your own businesses, which, where is your favorite place to eat in Aberdeen? Kevin, do it quick off. Awkward. <laughs> <laughs> um, to be honest, I don't really go out to eat much in Aberdeen. I say show local. <laughs> Just because I work every night, I get, what's open on a Monday night? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, I like Coffee Bohem. Mm -hmm. um, I like Moonfish. Mm -hmm. um, Best chippy in Aberdeen. Best chippy that sells champagne. <laughs> There's that. Um, yeah, the best chippy would be probably Stonehaven, mm -hmm. the bay. Carl's yeah, a great job there, I think. He's shaking his head. No. Oh, right. Favourite fishing... Yeah. Let's make this a question. Favourite fishing chip shop, Alex? Uh, sea salt and salt dice. Yeah. 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 Without a doubt, yeah. Ricky and his team knock it out of the park. Yeah, the bay is just... <laughs> oh. I'll have a shot. Not even life. the best chippy in Stonehaven, mate, I'll tell you. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, Eve. <laughs> um, Favourite fish and chips? F fish and hook. Fish and hook. Is that what's called on Rosemount? Yeah. Is that what it's yes, fish yes, and hook, yes, I think. Yes, yes. Um, it's beside the same spray, yes. it's like beside there, really good. And I do like sea salt and sole as well. The cats do yeah. chicken goujons from there. I know oh. it's not fish and chips, but still, so fine. Nice. And going back to favourite place to eat in Aberdeen. Uh, it, it is really tough. Um, you know, it's gone pricey to go out. We've been to Amuse for special dinners. We had our wedding anniversary at Amuse last year, and it was fantastic. Uh, we go to Olive Alexander's quite regularly mm -hmm. for their small plates. It's yep. great. Um, go down to the beach. Uh, Roots down at the beach. Yep. It's fantastic, and amongst others, yeah, Roots. Oh, ooh, Roots are getting ooh, some big up ooh, love, ooh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the Italian restaurants are great. Da Vinci's, Rustico, um, Indian restaurants, Travancore, 8848. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so struggling for choice. <laughs> well, you are a bit. Nargili <laughs> nearby us, they deserve a shout Not as in they're bad, I mean, because you've got so many. Yeah, oh, all right, I'm going loads now, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, P1, if I had to pick one, I couldn't. But, yeah, th there are some really good ones, yeah, but a lot. I, I, apart from Amuse, kind of modern Scottish, the, there's nothing in the city, no. Great. Eve? We really like Eurokobi by CJ. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah Japanese shape. sushi, yeah, you missed that one out. Yeah. Was it on your list? Um, <laughs> Project Pizza as well. Yes. Um, I know it's not really a dining place, no, but still. we're big it's fans, food. Project Pizza. Um, and a new guy on the scene that we've become really friendly with is, um, recently is, I think he's changed his name now to Just Greek. He's down at Westburn Park, the mm. Greek guy. Oh, the, the Giros and stuff, uh, yeah. So we were kind of friendly with him. We met him in Bridget Dawn in his van and he's been coming into the shop. Mm. So we've seen it mm. go from the little van in Bridget Dawn Same to where, the, where he is yeah. now. So yeah, they're, they're my top three. Great, mm. lots of food for thought. Yeah. Well, that takes us to the end of tonight's panel. I think we can give our guests a big, massive <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> well done. There we go. And just want to say a few thank yous before we go to. So, um, firstly, on your place settings, there's a QR code to scan. If you can leave your feedback on what you liked about tonight, what you think could be better, what could change it'll help for future events like this. Um, coming up at Resident X, we, there's a, another live podcast happening on the 3rd of August. Um, ADH, uh, ADHD as females, um, Donna and Laura are in the room. I think they're somewhere, they're around the back. They're gonna be uh, doing this uh, next month. Um, tickets aren't on sale yet, but they will be soon, so keep an eye out for that as well. Um, a big thank you to Stuart, and the team at Pirate Photography for making us all heard tonight and filming us all. I know it's been a bit stressful, but thank you. Uh, thank you to Dave and the team at Resin X for giving the opportunity to do this. It's, I didn't expect to ever do a live podcast, so here we go. 
And uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I thought I'd be happy with like 40 tickets. I didn't expect to have uh, this many people in one room. So it's really nice to see you all. And I hope you've enjoyed it. And all that's left for me to say is stay safe, eat well, and speak soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.